Um, maybe uh, we could start by looking at what we already have gathered uh, in the Slido. So if uh, colleagues if colleagues could show me and you will all see also on the screen the different questions that we have already collected and thank you for those. So uh, most popular question at the moment uh, that has received 13 votes is a question to uh, Simin and of course it's a political one. So, populist parties thrive on discontent. They don't actually want to solve problems. So, why would any populist party do what you propose, Simon? <laughs> I think what I'm proposing is not to the populist parties, it's to the ones who are against the populist party. <coughs> yeah. I think. <laughs> yes. I think um, um, I was looking at you, <laughs> not at the populist party. I was just trying to say, that, yes, the first line of the question, I absolutely agree, and that's what I've been trying to, to suggest. And then the solution to that is to tackle the, the underlying causes of the rise of populism. And I'm not necessarily saying just the one underlying cause. I mean, there are multiple factors, but we are here today to talk about disparities and cohesion. So... It is the job, it's the duty, the responsibility of all of us and also our non-populist parties to actually address these issues. Um, um, because what we are facing now is the entire, um, it's an existential threat to the European project. Thank you very much, Simon. Then we can uh, move on with the uh, additional questions that have been raised. So uh, another question that was uh, raised, should FUAS be stable over time and at what scale? Uh, should we have uh, them for every, uh, should every place be part of a FUA or can they focus only on uh, metropolitan areas? Maybe Tim, you could uh, pick up on that. Sorry. Um, I think, I think uh, we've, as the question alludes to, I think the, question, uh, the answer is probably no, uh, that we cannot assume that functional urban areas are stable over time um, and that the, uh, the challenge is to in what ways can institutions catch up to the growing scale as, as it usually is um, and uh, in what sense are, is that uh, catch up feasible and we can see attempts around uh, the world to increasingly expand the the territorial scale of of a of a cooperative mechanism, and sometimes in many in many parts of the world, there's a recognition that moving beyond an already established institutional arrangement is very tricky, uh, and therefore it may be more feasible to use uh, to build on what is already there and build different forms of institutional cooperation between perhaps a metropolitan level. Uh, arrangement and then the wider regional fun functional linkages that need to, to happen and that, and that might take place through informal and formal practices but uh, I, I guess others in the room will have a view but it seems that clearly flexibility uh, in our approach and in what ways uh, uh, functional urban areas have, have changed vastly in, third, in, the, in the last 30 years and will change just as vastly in the next 30 years so we should be alive to that. Thank you very much, Tim, for this feedback. And then if we move on with some additional questions, so we also have a question about the difference between place-based and place-sensitive policies. I think this is a very good question for you and Simon, considering your intervention on the overall narrative of territorial cohesion and a place-based approach. Um, for a fuller explanation of the difference, I would refer you to a very good um, piece of work which was done for the Commission recently by two LSE academics, Michael Stoper and uh, Andres Rodriguez Bose. So they, are, they provide much fuller explanation that I can do here. But I think the gist of it is that 
um, if we say place-based, it means that we are just entirely focusing on the locality and everything which is there kind of endogenously. To change it a slice, slightly to place sensitive just flags the fact that places are not isolated from, the rest, from other places and from the global trends. So it's a combination of acknowledging the impact of those trends on places and what's happening within the place itself. And I suppose to some extent it's also the acknowledgement of that we shouldn't be pitting people versus places, which some people do. You know, there has been a lot, I mean, for the last God knows how many years, there is a kind of a line in uh, about, we should just focus on, if, if the ultimate aim is the welfare of individual, why bother thinking about the place? Uh, Norman Tebbit, a former uh, official in the UK, once said, if you can't find a job in your city, get on your bike and go to, actually he said it to the, the miners uh, strike in the 80s, that uh, instead of rioting and making so much fuss, just get on your bike and go to where the jobs are. This is the very kind of what we call place ignorant and spatially blind and all of that. So that's been one line and the other line has been, no, we just have to f think about places. And I think this notion of sensitive is trying to say it's not going, it's not an either or. We should be focusing on people and their welfare, education, opportunities, and all of that, but we should also be focusing on places. So, so that is probably the best way to distinguish between the two, plus the fact that, as I said, acknowledging the global impact on places. I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this feedback. Now I would like to uh, stop with the Slido questions for a moment and uh, ask if there are any colleagues in the room who would like to uh, share their experiences. Uh, so please, we have already one colleague. Um, please, if you could introduce uh, yourself to everybody. I'm sure most of us know you, but... <laughs> and you will get a, a microphone from uh, my team. Sorry, from the Romanian presidency this time. <laughs> so please introduce yourself and uh, share with us your comments, insights on the subject. Okay, well, uh, my name is uh, Martin Guillermo. Martin, uh, I know, it, 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 we, I have met many of you, but you who know, I'm just representing the Association of European Regions. Uh, we have been working for yeah, many decades on this, and we are very happy to live in this moment in which uh, territorial cooperation is really on the agenda. So um, in this time of post-truth and rampant nationalism, EU skepticism, Brexit, I don't believe in Brexit actually. Um, <laughs> the, it is really, uh, we are living in a very interesting momentum in which uh, territorial cooperation is really in the agenda at all levels. Uh, most of the uh, speeches about uh, uh, Europe are taking into account the, what is really happening on the ground. We are, we are quite happy about that. And even this is becoming an inspiration in other continents. So I think uh, we, are, we have a big challenge and a big opportunity at the same time. So um, I think, of course, the European institutions are not, this is more a reflection than a question, uh, uh, being inspired with what you said, because you were doing in a very good way putting all these concepts, place-based approach, future functional areas, etc. So I think, I would like to share with you and with the audience a couple of, of things. Um, so uh, I think it's in, the, the attitude of the Commission is clearly uh, has, uh, has been a big input. The cross-border review, the communication on border regions in 2017, and all the measures that have been developed afterwards, I think, uh, uh, also are doing a lot. That's putting, and of course, they were developed by ESPON. When we go through the projects that are being presented in these days, many of them are very much related to what we do. So we are very happy because this is food for thought, but still I would like to stress how difficult sometimes it is to match the results and the outputs of uh, what the researchers are doing and what perhaps the practitioners are expecting. Or, and even sometimes we find that there is a lack of connection in between both languages. 
Uh, this is not your responsibility. Of course, it's not the resp responsibility of the, the uh, practitioners. And perhaps it is our role and the role of ESPON, Interact, and other initiatives to try to match both. We try our best. And by uh, having a dialogue, I think uh, we are more or less going to the point. Perhaps practitioners need a bit more scientific approach and to think a little bit on the results of uh, knowledge exercises. Uh, I, I always ask uh, the researchers to pay a look what the practitioners are doing and even what are their challenges, etc. And overall, we ask the politicians to please take into account both, which is not always the case. If we add the interests of civil society, then we have a quadruple helix. That would be the point where we would like to achieve. In, in this sense, I would like to show, share with you what we can consider from our experience. It's not scientific, it's not empiric, let's say. Uh, some preconditions, and, uh, uh, which are the lessons learned in these years of uh, five generations of Interreg. We think that, um, first of all, and I would like to stress what Professor Dawoodi said, we need a kind of, uh, we call it positive discrimination of challenging areas, actually, uh, as uh, for any other vulnerable groups. Uh, uh, border areas, which is our, is our focus, particularly rural, peripheral, etc. Uh, they need some uh, uh, positive discrimination if we want to achieve a certain degree of territorial cohesion. And here we think that there are several preconditions that were mentioned by you in a different way, but at the end we are going to the same direction, which is political way, uh, will at all levels. Uh, we always say particularly at national state level. Uh, and especially to work across borders. We have to consider our neighbors in border areas, not as neighbors, but as part of our development strategy. So to consider really as functional areas. And sometimes elected politicians have difficulties to think of investing money on the other side of the border, for instance, or even to consider to, to take, have an approach on areas where there are no voters. And despite of the uh, limited scope of four years election period, and sometimes it's difficult for them to think a bit over this period. Perhaps it's our mission to go in this direction. Then uh, we need, I think we have to work more on the empowerment and appropriation by citizens about these policies. It's after 30 years almost of interreg, there is a lack of knowledge even in the areas where we are implementing. And people are using L uh, instruments which have been developed by these policies, but they don't know. So, uh, and even, the, really, we have tried different ways of communicating, and it seems uh, difficult. And uh, on, ill, on in all, uh, of course, we need measures addressed to increase mutual trust. This is probably we are not going to repeat this enough, uh, because everybody is talking about trust. But is, is this really happening at cross-border areas? Let's look at the Northern Ireland uh, uh, feelings about what is going on in London, just to put an example which is known by anyone. And last but not least, I would like to stress a couple of mistakes that have been made, and probably we, are, we have some responsibility. Um, uh, I think that sometimes uh, ETC uh, programs are, in some places, are being um, instrumentalized and not capitalized. And this, I would like to, if you have a trick how to do it, uh, I would be very pleased to ask our politicians to do it. Um, yeah, uh, and of course, um, I, we are really sorry, this is the last point, but I think it's the most important, about the lack of interest about new instruments. ITI was a big, big expectation for especially in cross-border areas and only one has been implemented. We are really sorry for that. Perhaps we are not able to explain it sufficiently. <coughs> Next period could be an opportunity. An instrument like the European cross-border mechanism to, to solve uh, problems uh, of legal and administrative nature across the border are also not well understood, especially by nation states. If you have any uh, clue <laughs> on how we can better explain that, I would be very pleased. Thank you very much. So. Thank you very much for your uh, comments and, and your insights uh, on, the, on the subject. Uh, colleagues, uh, Simon, Tim, anything to uh, reflect upon? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> well, I would certainly concur with the, the com comment that uh, communication gaps, communication failures between researchers and practitioners are, uh, remain alive and well. Uh, and that this is an essential uh, priority um, to to explain and communicate and consolidate exactly what are the experiences so far, the values um, that have been uh, of, of cooperation, the risks of of certain uh, policy approaches compared, to, and we need we need to encapsulate those things in in meaningful narrativistic ways. I think in order to to capture 
w whether we like it or not, the, the interest and attention of, of those making decisions, uh, while all of the time, as you said, making and training uh, policy makers and, and uh, those in civil servants, uh, civil service to be, to be more aware of, 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 the, of the nuances and the complexities all of the time. So I agree that communication is fundamental to this. Um, and I might just say that, of course, the, the challenge about how do uh, local governments or sometimes even larger scales of government um, agree or commit to investing or accepting investment or agreeing to investment beyond their borders is obviously a key challenge. And n nowhere is this always is e is ever easy. But normally there there tends to be more uh, willingness to accept this. Firstly, when there is some kind of long term a plan where there's a recognition that if you're not going to benefit from the investment in the first phase, there may be some additional phases in which that's going to be extended or in which your, your area or, or region will be prioritized. And secondly, when there is a very strong um, evidence base regarding uh, what the value of doing this first uh, investment is and, and how that uh, needs to be something that isn't purely, as we've already heard, based around aggregate uh, impacts, but is in terms of... Uh, impacts across places and spaces as well. So I think there, there are ways in which um, uh, encouraging that commitment to, uh, are beginning to be learned and we, we should pull together those ideas as well. Thank you very much, Tim. Simon, or we pick up additional comments and then... You can, just, just one point that I'd like to say which, which is very relevant to, the, uh, to our discussion. We didn't talk as much about that, run out of time maybe, is on the functional areas and, the, and, and what is happening in many countries as we see the creation of what you may call metropolitan governance or city region governance or all, all the same thing, functional area governance. Um, and sometimes you see resistance to the development of that and it, it often depends on how it's being developed. I know about Finland because we had a very large project which just completed around the city region null governance. But what's happening in Finland is not the devolution of power from the central government to the city regional level. It's the other way around. It's taking the power away from the very traditionally very strong, very autonomous municipalities and giving it to the mid-layer of governance. Therefore, it's quite clear that there will be resistance. And we just did... We just did a report and it was launched by Michael Heseltine. Some of you have heard of his name, very powerful figure in British uh, politics. And, uh, uh, you know, and he reminded <coughs> us of the trouble that we've had in, in England in creating these mid-level of governance. And he put it very nicely. I mean, he said, well, I talked to Margaret, meaning Margaret Thatcher and this and that. And, and the reason that it didn't happen at the time that it should have happened was that it was like he went, they went to the parliament and they asked the Turkey to vote for Christmas. Of course, you get an answer, no, because the municipalities do not want to lose their power. And it's not just about sort of power game. There is an issue, a deeper issue, that we all have to pay attention when we talk about functional area, and that is democratic legitimacy of these layers of government and accountability. So some people feel that if you take the decision-making to the upper level, it will be more difficult for people on the ground to access that because it's just going up and up and up. So that is something that we need to take into account. Whatever layer of governance we are creating, it should be owned by people on the ground. And it should f match people's sense of place and we, we, we could never get it in England because our regions for example are just a statistical sort of constructs really it doesn't make sense to many people so these are the these are the other issues that I was trying to say that the boundaries of the functional area should be something that people feel familiar with or feel that it's relevant to, to whatever we are trying to do. And I think it's very important to bring people along in the development of those uh, governance uh, sort of frameworks. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, please, also we have additional comments from the audience. 
the microphone is coming. Thank you. Tobias Schiller from the University of Erlangen in Germany. And I would like to pick up this more critical remark from Simin and um, come back to the question of how to, because I think um, we saw examples from all over the world where um, functional uh, areas are invented, established and tested. And everybody is in favor of functional areas. I'm too, and I think the whole room is in favor of it. But if we have a look close into these regions, there's a lot of disappointment, um, and uh, it's it's a really it's a difficult uh, issue to to have good functional areas with a good governance. And this how-to question is is really a challenge. And I would say, well, um, it's normal that parameters and, and policies do not always fit the uh, the dynamic world we're living in. So you have to to move in a way. And one way would be to further develop the classical hard uh, institutions. And that's difficult, and uh, there's not one default solution. And the more obvious solution is to have soft spaces, in a way. And most of the examples that we discussed here are very soft spaces. That uh, does not lead into the dilemma that you mentioned, that there is a fear of technocratic centralism, but there's just a soft space. And I'm in favor of soft spaces, it's not that, but it's, uh, they are soft in a way. They do not have a real budget, they do not have a real political mandate, and I would say that there are many functional areas that are soft spaces that do not make a difference in the end. So they are not a solution to the problems there. I mean, we look at uh, metropolitan areas, um, I'm living in one um, where there's no real budget, there's no political mandate, and uh, there's a taboo on spatial planning or spatial development. And to become even more provocative, one could say that there is spatial blindness in many functional spaces. I mean, uh, I know many border regions uh, that are good in having a small projects and bicycle uh, um, lanes and so on, but uh, there's no spatial development ambition at all. And uh, the same is true for many metropolitan uh, corporation issues. There you have one mandate, uh, there should be a rapid rail, and that's it. Don't talk about whatever spatial planning, cohesion, whatsoever. So it's really... Um, and, and there's a second um, danger, I would say, that um, functional areas can lead to sectoralization in the end. So not an integrated territorial development, but just sectoral topic, and that... So I think this is uh, not a clear to, to go back to the very classic hard uh, box-in-box uh, uh, approach, but if we want to have good functional regions, um, and they have to start with soft spaces in most of the cases, then we have to make sure two things. One is to have a real mandate, real budget, real resources, because without tools you cannot do anything. And the second uh, thing that I think is important is to have a territorial perspective in it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, before we move on with additional comments from, uh, from, uh, your, from your side, from the audience, because I see uh, at least three more uh, colleagues who would like to contribute, let's maybe pick up one uh, question from uh, the Slido that has received 17 votes so far. So the question is about uh, cohesion. Cohesion equals to me, uh, for me to redistribution. How do you see the future of territorial cohesion in Eastern Europe, considering the furious opposition to social policies and the obsessive tax cut pro-business policies promoted by all parties in the region? Anything to say about that? Simon, maybe? Absolutely agree. <laughs> um, well, let me, I mean, this is not me, really. A lot of people are saying that. And let me quote a very authoritative um, view on this. You've heard of Thomas Piketty. His, his book, Capital in 21st Century, you know, became a bestseller overnight. He is a French economist, so he's not a politician. He's not a political scientist. He's an economist. Just finished a book called World Inequality Report. It was published in 2018, okay? They looked at over 200 countries, you know, and crunched a lot, and a lot of numbers and figures. The first thing that they came up with is that inequalities are rising everywhere. 
which in itself is a, an interesting conclusion. And secondly, in, in an interview in relation to that report, he said that the single reason for it has nothing to do with economy. The single reason is the politics and the ideology. He says, because we do not have the right policies in place. And obviously, he's not a territorial geographer. He's not a geographer, so he doesn't talk much about geography and territory. But he did mention that one of the reasons is we do not have the right taxation system in place. The fact that one-tenth of the world wealth is held in tax havens, imagine how much money is that, should raise some eyebrows, should raise some issues with regard to inequalities. So I suppose everybody in this room, including the person, people who have um, raised that question, are absolutely true that we do need the right policies in place. We ha it will be very, even if it's not ideological, it will be rather lazy to say that the best we can do is to let the market sort things out. The invisible hand. There is no invisible hand. If we leave everything entirely, I'm talking about entirely, to market, things will go wrong. So as government, as people, we have to do something. We have to talk about, OK, and what is the right thing to do? I do not want to prescribe what is the right thing to do, but we have to do something. We can't just leave it to kind of agglomeration effects and all those other stuff, a bunch of formula and this invisible hand, which is a mystical thing. So that is probably, uh, so I, 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 all I'm trying to say is that I fully agree that without the, without the right policies, whatever they might be, and they can't be just the same policy everywhere, it has to fit you know, the history, the tradition uh, of, of the place. Um, something needs to be done. Because what, the one thing that I suppose we all agree, and the evidence is there to show us, that inequal, I mean, that level of inequality, we are talking about a huge level of inequality that are happening at the moment and is getting worse, is not good. It's not good for anyone. Thank you so much. We have more comments from uh, the audience. Yes, please. We have, uh, yeah, the lady with the microphone. My name is uh, Peter Nijkem, the Netherlands. I first of all would like to thank uh, Simon and Tim for a very interesting and informed uh, presentation. Um, we live in a, uh, a world full of fake news, populism, fragmentation, loss of ideas, ideals, and many other things which make our life and our world rather complicated. In this whole debate, ESPON has played an important role in favoring especially debates on uh, cohesion and in particular territorial cohesion. Now what I would like to do uh, in my short comment may be to question a little bit also the fundamental remit of what brings us together and see whether perhaps we might get some sort of a new perspective on what might be needed for, for Europe. Now, of course, there's always a danger of, of putting um, new wine, of old wine in new bottles. i just give you one example. Um, more than 25 years ago, together with my colleagues Michael Wegener and Dave Bannister and a few others, Ian Masser, we did a book on Europe 2020. And we have tried to sketch out scenarios for Europe after 25 years uh, in terms of new perspectives on uh, spatial fragmentation in Europe. Now it's almost 2020, and when I look back into what we wrote by then, with all kinds of drastic and business as usual scenarios, the most realistic scenario which has emerged out of many radical and many conventional scenarios is the most conventional scenario, almost business as usual. Europe has not changed very much in terms of its spatial fragmentation strategy, policy, 
and implementation. So that also makes us a little bit modest in terms of the grand ideals which have been favored by our speakers and also from the audience. But I still feel there might be a need for a, re a drastic reorientation. And let me put two things. First, is cohesion a meaningful basis for spatial policy? We have here on the... Uh, this beautiful screen, the statement of the Romanian presidency, cohesion, a common European value. Is cohesion indeed a common European value? And is cohesion always a good thing? And is cohesion perhaps only a tool, a possible vehicle to achieve higher order ideals? Or is it a goal in itself? I give you one simple example. The medium-sized city I live in is contingent to an, another medium-sized city. These two cities, one metropolitan area, have deliberately decided not to work together. It's in the interest of the citizens not to work together to be as separate as possible. No cohesion. Very rational decision. So that's why I question whether cohesion in all cases would be a good, good thing. And that brings us to the question, I think, whether maybe another perspective, as recently advocated by many scholars like Amartya Senet on the capability analysis, i.e., we have to make sure that we maximize the number of opportunities for our citizens and our regions and our cities, might be a meaningful perspective. And policy should try to maximize the opportunities rather than to go for a vague notion like cohesion, just put it in a rather exaggerating way. A second uh, remark I would like to make is on the question whether the territory is a meaningful uh, unit for uh, policy and scientific research. Tim and also others have already argued, well, in the functional urban area, they are floating, they are never stable, they emerge. Yes, they emerge and, and they are uh, dynamic, but it also questions again, whether the territory, which is a value-loaded concept and which has to do with ownership conditions and self-defense strategies, look at the Brexit discussion, that's on the territory, whether the territory at the end is still a meaningful unit for the future, for our policies, etc. I'll give you one example again. My territory, personal territory, is the world. I have more interactions. I'm not a commuter, so that makes my life easier, but I travel all over the world. I have more connections with many regions in many parts of the world than in the regions surrounding myself. In a digital era, the type of connectivity we are observing is completely different from physical connectivity in terms of commuting flows, shopping flow, transport flows, etc. I do my internet shopping through the computer. I have no idea what my relevant territory from that perspective is. I only know that I am I'm working in a network. That brings me to the final point. Is the network as a multi-layer set of organized set of activities for human behavior? That could be work, that could be shopping, that could be recreation, that could be research. Is the network in multiple layers not, not much more a meaningful concept for policy, strategy, and research than the old-fashioned concept of a territory. I realize one thing, of course, and it's also where ESPOM has played an important role, we need statistics. And our administrative statistics, nuts one, two, up uh, to 10, uh, et cetera, more or less de define what the scope is of our research and hence our policy. But should we determined by statistics at the end of the day? Thank you so much. Any feedback, reflection on that? Or we gather additional comments? Happy to just a few, maybe not to go into a lot of detail. Thank you very much, Peter, for those uh, comments and reflections. I think your most provocative question uh, was to do with is cohesion always a good thing? Um, I suppose a very short answer to that question is it, de it depends on how we define cohesion. For me, cohesion is about more equalities. And if that's the meaning of cohesion, this is me. I mean, other people might have different definition of it. And that's the, always a problem with these words. But for me, if that is the meaning of it, 
The answer is absolutely yes, it is a good thing if it means more equality. Um, then the, the, the second provocation, uh, again very nicely put, was to do with the notion of territory. Um, I use the word space rather than territory, but to, to sort of share, to share our ideas here, we, 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 we are happy to use the word territory, but we know its limitations. Um, and you're absolutely right to raise the, the issue about the network and so on, which takes us back to the whole debate we had, and Tim uh, was constantly actually emphasizing in his talk that the boundaries of these areas are, are just, are just um, social constructs. You know, we just make them. They don't exist there. And you're right that a lot of us are connected to the other side of the world more maybe than our neighbors, next door neighbors. But having said all of that, we should not conclude from that observation, which is an absolutely right observation, to say that places don't matter. Because no matter how networked I am, the place that I live and work in still matters to me. And it matters to a whole host of other people in Newcastle who are not as networked as I am. Some of them have never ever left their neighborhood, let alone Newcastle City. So it's still, the, so even from pure neoclassical economic perspective, place matters. Okay? So, and the, the scenarios, I think that was the best thing. I, I really like that. Isn't that such a good idea that we go back to the scenarios we've made many years ago and see which one actually came through? And, and Peter um, telling us that the business as usual actually happened. But I just want to remind everybody that the scenario was made 25 years ago when neoliberalism was on the rise. So what do you expect? That was the business as usual. Thank you so much. I saw two more hands in the audience and as we have only um, five minutes left, I would probably prioritize those reflections from the audience. Uh, and uh, excuse this, the slider for a moment. So I saw Maria and also there was a hand. Maybe we can start with Maria then. No, we, we need it for the, um, for the web streaming. Yeah, sorry about that. But here you go. Maria from Italy. Uh, I use a lot, uh, from a lot of time uh, as a semin. Uh, remind the, the functional urban areas, but not in this uh, idea, this uh, conceptual framework, because uh, I suggest you to call them systemic uh, functional areas. Because uh, if we wish to go over the boundaries, the administrative, political, we have, uh, uh, we have to have another vision and to match uh, as a Simin, but also uh, um, Ilona said from the beginning, uh, that we need to combine geographical, economic, social, and so, so, so on. And this uh, is uh, the unique uh, uh, way to combine uh, by systemic vision. Second point, uh, I'm, as a stakeholder, I don't know, uh, as a researcher stakeholder, I am applying this uh, concept uh, to calculate the territorial cohesion. Because uh, uh, FUA, uh, FUA are a sentinel of the level that each regional system, national system, local system um, reacts to at, at a time, at the moment. I can calculate territorial cohesion by FUA now or uh, um, the, the next uh, year or in the future. Second, but not least, they are the territorial base to calculate the territorial impact assessment of our policy now and in the future. And uh, I can say this because I am applying this in Italy to calculate why we uh, do not spend in Italy or spend better. And the, re the, the result is that each uh, uh, different territorial FUA as a special uh, 
um, message to send. If a policymaker do not, does not reach this message, it's spend, it's a policy, it's, a, it's a special planning, it's a wrong. And so we have the risk to not catch the real policy need. And so the place evidence of territorial cohesion by FUA permit us to cover this gap. And it is not only a mechanicism economic uh, question. And please, China, USA, use this functional area to create free zone, economic zone, or contrary, to uh, create a similar democratic message to give it to territorial situation because the, the, the polycentric functional activity is a top-down and no bottom-up solution in China, but this is a, a semi-democratic message to global system. Thank you, Maria. If you could pass on the microphone to, to the colleague next to you, and then we hear from the colleague, then we hear some final remarks from, uh, from our keynote speakers, and then we should close the session very soon, unfortunately, because I see, of course, that there are many more uh, questions that we could discuss, and I'm sure you will have an opportunity to discuss them in the following sessions where we will break up into workshops and discuss the different aspects of the functional integration at three uh, scales. But before that, uh, please, the floor, the floor uh, is yours. I'm Livy Yanashi. I'm teaching in the University of Architecture and Planning in Bucharest. Um, and um, first of all, I want to express my admiration for the two presentations here, which were both on the same music but complementary in my view, in my perception. And uh, I would uh, allow myself to make some superficial commentaries because I don't think that after the substance was delivered here, too many more things could be inside. And I will start with a, with a half joke. Uh, Romanian is a, is a Latin language, and like in French, we have the same word for policy and politics, and that is a disaster. <laughs> I don't think you need more explanation on that. <laughs> uh, that this, the, um, and, and that's why I admire Professor Davudi so much, because I think she, um, by, by reviewing the concept, and I started to work, I worked in the ministry who's organizing this meeting, in the 90s, when the Europe 2000 and 2000 plus were something which generated scandal. And when uh, um, sustainability became a kind of buzzword that was taken aboard by politicians and, and put in all possible mud and devoided of anything, yet we did it 30 years to realize that it was a good concept and we should work on it. Um, so the, the second remark would be related to Mr. Moonen's presentation, and I would say that Yes, I, well, I grew up in the structural approach. That was the ages in the 70s, hippie and structuralism. Um, and I think that we use models to understand things. We build models and we use models as representations. As soon as we try to use a model as a pattern in which to pour the reality, there, there come again the risks. That's why I think that as many models we may have, either on city regions or metropolitan regions or functional urban areas. And by the way, functional was a word for, for 20 or 30 years, was completely banned. Now it's again on the, on the rise. Um, uh, we have to, to be aware of the, of the conditions. And here I come back to Romania a little bit. I think that this, this game between what goes bottom up what comes top to down as a, and uh, to, to the remark of the previous speaker, to what is understanding from the national or even upper level. And that's where the EU might be very useful in, in explaining these things. That's, that's where the, the different policies should tune each other. And I have two, two small um, other remarks. One is related to uh, what was said earlier about the economics and the politics. I think the history of Europe proves us that, yes, economy moves quicker. It's not the invisible men, it's the invisible men of those who make profits that works on that, but I don't want to sound too leftish. 
And uh, whenever the political establishment, the, be them parties or royalties or something, delayed to adjust and to understand, we reached the crisis. It was before the second, before the first world war, earlier. Uh, so that's why I think it's, it's very important to, to debate these things. And here I come back to the territorial cohesion, and I would like to, I, I dare to compliment you. I, it's also dealing not only with equality, but with the existing attraction forces that keeps us together. And that's why I think that territorial cohesion, it's more in the same time, is a principle and it's a value. I don't think it's the risk to make it the buzzword and, 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 uh, and pick it there is already is quite high. Functional urban area might be a concept, might be an instrument. That's, that's interesting to be discussed. And again, by modeling and by understanding other models and then in the classical approach to see how we can do that in X and Y situation, that's completely different. And I remember that um, it was an English, uh, when I worked in, in the 90s in the European Commission of Europe, it was an English planner, Mr. John Zetter, yeah? And he said that spatial planning becomes exponentially more politic, political as the territory becomes arithmetically more expanded. So, and I think that's, that's very true. And where I think, and I, again, I'm not, uh, I'm not a member of the um, ESPON team, only as more as a client, the holder, and the beneficiary of all the ESPON works. I have very few implications in ESPON work, but I use them. Um, I would say that here we have probably to move also or to put on the agenda the idea of how better we communicate our results, not only in terms of making them available, but in making them heard by the politicians. And that's why, but that's because I'm an academic and I'm fully Mrs. W will, and, and Tim Moonen will join me. That's why I think the education should go out of academic and make, make, be more militant, I'm not afraid of this word, in the professional field for these values and realities. Because otherwise, the, 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 the emperor is naked and we admire the clothes. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, short final remarks from our two keynote speakers before we proceed with our program for today. Um, maybe Tim can start. Um, thank you. Fantastic, thought-provoking questions all around. There are four things that I think uh, really uh, strike me from what's been said and uh, that I think we would be well uh, uh, advised to think m more carefully about as we, as we conduct these two days, but in the, in the weeks, months and years ahead. I mean, I think firstly, to, to Peter's point um, around... Uh, the future of the meaning and the rhetorical weight of territory and cohesion. I, I have uh, no answers or wish to propose answers directly to that, but only to say that I observe in lots of my work in cities and with businesses and with leaders around the world as, uh, an increasing reticence to think um, about uh, territories as if they are these defined entities and more a concern uh, and a reluctance to make bold investments or reforms around a particular kind of territorial phenomenon uh, because of a concern that technology or politics or society may overtake uh, and uh, render that approach irrelevant. And I, in general, I see a, a, a shift towards more granular and tactical approaches than grand and uh, territorial uh, in the way that you were describing, harder and kind of more um, sort of robust uh, functional uh, integration and uh, of course this is the risk but it's, a, it's also a perceived reality that is, is creating a, a lot of rigidity. Secondly, um, I think there's uh, a big question we need to think about more carefully as to, to whether the soft innovations that we see all around the world uh, firstly, which ones work and which ones enable other things to happen afterwards? And then secondly, when is it not enough? On what issues is it not enough? On what uh, agendas is it in insufficient? And when, at uh, what moment uh, in the cycle of evolution of a functional area is there an imperative to really work together and to build something harder and more uh, 
uh, more meaningful, to use your language. Um, and I think we need to understand those tactics uh, and those chronological and evolutionary d dimensions much more clearly. Um, thirdly, I think we've heard quite a lot about democracy uh, and the, to me, there's always a tension, in effect, between the fact that we want um, citizen representation, citizen engagement on these functional questions. But, of course, uh, as was raised in the questioning and as we've heard elsewhere, there is a, a widespread cynicism and distrust and dislike towards these kind of uh, agendas. And also local governments, in, for example, are increasingly, or, or perhaps you might say, are, are in, in inherently... Um, invested in the support of existing residents rather than, as we heard in the questioning there, um, the f those who are going to in future live in, in, in a given functional area or perhaps future generations for whom there are other imperatives that need to be also borne in mind aside immediate democratic um, requirements. So there's a big question about to what extent uh, functional areas and democracy need to be um, considered more carefully and, and what, to what extent uh, we, we, where we, where we rate and rank those relative values, and then finally, that the question around identity, belonging, and attachment seems very important as well. And uh, I think there's something uh, that we see happening around the attempt to build that, and um, whether that's something that's a research agenda or something deserving of our attention, or whether we regard it as superficial. I think there's something that needs to be addressed more straight battedly around whether. Uh, identity and uh, formation around functional areas is something we can aim for. What what kind of uh, what will it allow us to to achieve if we do it? So um, those agendas, I think, are all very key, and look forward to talking about it more. Thank you. I think um, for the final remarks, I'll, I really like to go back. First of all, I want to thank everybody for being patient and and for wonderful comments and some of the questions and apologies for not being able not having time to answer some of the questions, especially the ones that were addressed to me. Hopefully we catch up over the coffee time. Uh, but the final remark is really to ESPON. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've been involved in ESPON before it was ESPON. It was called something else. And it all started as, when, it, when we started, it was more as a lobbying, a campaign for some of the things that we are talking today. And, and, and then also obviously saying that we are a bunch of researchers and academics and so on and would like to provide the evidence for all of that. So I think, I think ESPAN should be commended for two things. One, of course, for its, um, its bread and butter, which is providing the research and the evidence and so on on these issues. But secondly, and for me that is more important than the first one, is to keep up the momentum, both the policy momentum and the political momentum on two issues which have been right at the heart of ESPON from the beginning. One is territory. We call it place, we call it space, we call it whatever we call it in our own different languages, to keep, to constantly say that places do matter. And they do matter to people's life and livelihoods. So that's the first thing. And I think ESPON's been um, I mean, significant in that respect, just running out of words. And the second thing that espon has been important in promoting is the notion of cohesion. Understood, cohesion defined and understood as more equality, more inclusive development, and better life for everybody. So in both of them, i really like to uh, congratulate Espon and, and wish that it continues its effort in the future. Thank you so Thank you so much Simon. Thank you so much Tim and uh, thank you especially for the last uh, the last words that you said because indeed this is also something that I wanted to say that this discussion today and also the the rich presentations that we've heard, um, all the different questions and issues that have been raised around the subject clearly indicates to me, to the, all the ESPON colleagues, that we need to continue working on, on, the, on this subject, definitely, uh, in the coming years. And uh, this will uh, definitely want, be one of the elements in our research work, uh, I would even say horizontal uh, elements in our research work uh, in the future, also in the context of the discussion on uh, post-2020 program, you will hear more about it also from uh, our managing authority uh, tomorrow, so uh, definitely this, uh, this topic deserves more attention, 
more practical attention, more political attention, more academic attention, and we will make sure from the, from the side of ESPON that we will uh, ensure that. Now, we have uh, one minute left before we all need to gather for the um, family photo and afterwards lunch. John will help us with some instructions for both. And right. thank you once again, Tim, let's uh, maybe, and, and yeah. Simon, let's give a, a loud round of applause. <laughs>